This is Mark Tobias with Wayne Barnes. Wayne is a retired special agent in the FBI, and we're going to talk today about background investigations, interviewing high-level applicants, and why it's important in today's climate in business and government. Uh, Wayne, you were in the Bureau for 29 years. Yep. Uh, many of those years you worked for in counterintelligence and you were also involved in one of the most high level and important cases that the Bureau had ever worked, the Robert Hansen spy case. That's correct. Um, you've worked a lot of criminal investigations. You used to be part of a joint task force with the CIA on recruiting and debriefing defectors from Eastern Bloc countries. Yes. When we had Eastern Bloc countries. <laughs> yeah. Back in the day. Back, back in the day. So I want to talk to you about interviewing applicants. All right. And specifically, uh, there was a series of interviews that you did for appli with applicants in 19, about 1986 that prompted you to develop now what is standard in not only the Bureau but the federal government, which is called a Personnel Security Interview. That's correct. PSI. Right. What is it? Uh, the Personnel Security Interview was set out because we had a set of individuals coming in who would be um, applicants for the language specialist position, those who actually had backgrounds that could not be verified. Someone who was raised in Yugoslavia, um, in Belgrade, went to college in Berlin, and there was no way to do a background check. So I found that if you ask questions about all aspects of their life, their family, their education, the jobs they've had, places they've been, travels, etc., cetera, uh, and did it with consistency, um, you could learn in great, great detail what they were doing in life, what made them tick, which was in essence the idea. So it boiled down to something like a verbal polygraph, where you couldn't do a background investigation physically, but you could do it face-to-face -face conversation. So the PSI now is used throughout the government, even the military, is that yes, correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, and I mean, in fact, uh, one of your sons was in the Marine Corps, and they told him he had to take a PSI, and he probably didn't know what that was. And Right, it's and I'm sure he knew more about the PSI than the <laughs> sergeant who was interviewing him with it, but that's ironic. So, should there be an equivalent, or is there an equivalent PSI for corporations, for major critical positions, CEO, COO, CFOs? I think there should be. Any, anyone who's being hired by a company, even if you're in a warehouse position or if you're working as, a, as an accountant and accounts receivable, you should have an application procedure and you should have some kind of an interview. But when you're talking about a senior level position, which would be a parallel to an SES, special executive position in the federal government, um, many times I've done these interviews where either CEOs or presidents or chairmen of the board are hiring someone who will be a direct report to them, but they don't know them, they haven't met them, they may have read some things about them. But when they want to learn the personality of the individual involved, it's not a question of whether they're coming in working for uh, an Eastern European intelligence service or the KGB or they're coming in to commit espionage, but they want to know about the individual personality, really what makes them tick. Uh, they'll ask for these interviews to be conducted, and I've just done many, many of them. Someone who's coming in to be in charge of offshore banking or the uh, editor of a newspaper the individual owns, uh, and they want this kind of interview conducted. We used to call them cradle-to-grave interviews but it takes at least two hours and uh, it's fairly comprehensive. Sometimes it goes on for three hours. Is, I've done a lot of interviewing in conjunction with polygraph examinations. Is there a specific techniques or personality traits that you're taught as agents in the Bureau that may differ from the commercial sector as far as interviewing? Uh, Obviously you're going, in criminal investigations, you're going for evidence of criminal conduct. But in applicant interviews, it's a little different. Right. The parallel to what you would be interested in for a CEO's interview of someone who's going to be a new director or a CFO or a quality position uh, would be the application procedure for uh, someone appointed as a federal judge. Uh, it's the most intense uh, interview and uh, background investigation we have because once a person achieves the point of being uh, in the federal robes unless they commit a felony of extreme proportion, they almost always just keep their clearance. So that is the kind of interview someone who's appointed as a judge would be parallel to this kind of a, a conversation. And I, if I were the CEO, if I were having someone come in who I didn't know other than what the resume said and what I'd heard, I would want this interview to take place. So what do they want to know? What, what, is, the, what, what, the, what, what, is, what does a CEO want to know? What's really critical? Oh, 
what's critical. When we interviewed um, people coming in who wanted to be FBI agents, uh, it would take a length of time, but it, invariably you wanted to know if this was a person who you, you could work with, who you wanted to teach the things that you know, wanted to be beside you. In bureau terms, do you want them going into the attic behind you and supporting you? And in a business level, it's will this person support me in my decisions so that um, we can make the company move forward and act consistently and coordinated. Well, the other thing today, there's a lot of fraud out there and some employees take jobs for other reasons than for working for corporations. Either espionage, trade secrets, uh, work comp fraud, there's a lot of reasons that people go to work for companies other than they just want to work for the companies. And so this would all be critical to determine um, in interviewing applicants. When you conduct a, a personnel security type interview, um, you really learn the gamut of what's going on in the individual's life. You may have a specific objective because there may have been an allegation that someone has an interest in committing industrial espionage or setting up something to you know, steal from the company, setting up a dummy company as a vendor where they get money each month. There could be a lot of reasons that are possible, but when you do these interviews, they're, they're fairly comprehensive and an awful lot of information comes out from them, which would include those kind of uh, points. And you're, you're looking really for inconsistencies, gaps, uh, things that don't look right. Right. Part and parcel to every application is a resume. And I found so many times you can see hundreds of articles uh, on the web about these kind of things. But when an individual's resume, it either in part or in whole, is fabricated, and it's astounding whether or not they have the degree from a certain institution, whether they actually went there for four years, whether they had a certain job, why they left the job they left. And we always do the resume verification as part of this. And if you can do it before the interview takes place, it's that much better. It's a very interesting moment in time when you ask a person a question and you know they're about to lie to you to watch what they're doing and how they do it. And it's terribly revealing for these people. So you mentioned you did a lot of backgrounds on federal judges, federal judge applicants. Right. That would almost be the most parallel to this kind of interview because you're dealing with very educated, sophisticated individuals, many times with significant egos. And I'll just give uh, one vignette. We had a, a man who was a state judge and he was being appointed as a nominee to be a federal judge. And uh, the federal robes are, are a significant level over state robes, if you will. Uh, just the consequence of the cases, um, even moving up in the appellate chain is all very important. And one particular individual uh, had been uh, married and divorced. And when we do these investigations for federal judge appointments, uh, I ran a team of 18 agents and we have 45 days to turn over, as we like to say, all the rocks in the stream of their life. If you find dirt or mud, you go farther to see what it is and what, what made it that way. But uh, many come out just nice and clean, but one of the agents came to me and said that his divorce was sealed. So I went back to the individual and I mentioned this point that we needed to open it to see what was there. And the reason, of course, would be um, the ex-wife or something came out in court may have indicated he took drugs or smoked marijuana or beat his wife or did some gambling situation that was inappropriate. But whatever's in there, you have to see it because it's a rock in the stream. And the individual was very reluctant to open it. So uh, I told him it was important that he couldn't get the judgeship without it. And he said, but you don't understand, it's sealed. And I said, I understand that, but I need it open. He said, but it's sealed. So I said, you have about 15 seconds to decide if you'd like to be a federal judge. And at 12 seconds, he gave the order to open the. So the idea is that you have to learn all the information about the individual. If they want the job, they have to answer the questions. And it's nothing can really be hidden. But then again, if you're getting a position with a company as a CFO, you should have all the cards on the table. And many times it's not important what you think would be important as an interviewee. As a good example, uh, the person who has the case for the judgeship and is doing the application background, uh, that's called your case agent. And I explained to the individuals getting these positions. And it's not just judges, it's people who are uh, nominated for appointments to the President's National Science Advisory Board. They give out million, billions of dollars in research to various institutions across the US those kind of presidential positions. And uh, I explained to them that it doesn't really matter to me if you went through a red light this morning, but it matters to me if, if you, you lie about it. If you didn't disclose it. Yeah, if you, if, you, yep. if you lie about it, that's what matters. And there's really only one rule, and the rule is don't lie to your case agent. So they, they get that idea. And many times we become fast friends after these interviews because they feel like they've literally laid themselves out on the table. 
So what's your best, in summary, what's your, if you were to make a few suggestions to individuals that are responsible for doing inter applicant interviews? I mean, how to conduct the interviews? Yeah. Well, uh, experience and on-job training and having done it in your previous years is always a good idea. Um, the personnel security interview um, noted on YouTube gives uh, information on the background and, and part of it. But it's understanding human nature. Uh, you can read books on psychology. Uh, Joe Navarro, who's a retired FBI agent who has written a book called Dangerous Personalities, goes into some detail when someone is a narcissist or a predator to understand the personality traits that individuals have which make them dangerous. Those are the kind of things that I read and I hand out actually to my colleagues so they can improve their skills with identifying problems in people's personalities. Yes, you sent me that book. I was wondering if there was an underlying <laughs> message there. Yeah, no, it wasn't that you might be, but I know we have no people in common who are in that category. So one of the most famous cases you were involved in in summation here I was in San Diego at a mental hospital. Yes, um, I was involved <laughs> with an agent named Keith Moses, a, a tremendous agent still in the Bureau, and we had a healthcare fraud investigation. There was a mental institution about nine stories high in San Diego, and uh, he had 60-some uh, agents come out, which was a search and seizure, and they were committing uh, healthcare fraud against Medicare. And I expected this to take most of the morning, but it turned out about 4.30 in the afternoon, all the agents had not had anything to eat for lunch. We were to hundreds and hundreds of boxes. We had to get two more rental trucks just to move all the boxes away. So at the end of the day, I, uh, um, Keith decided to get some food for his colleagues. So we called a local pizza place and said, I'd like to you know, order, I think it was 67 cans of soda and 19 large pizzas. And the fellow said, you know, and where would you like to deliver it? And he said to the Southwood Psychiatric Hospital, which is where we were. And uh, he said, the psychiatric hospital? And Keith said, yeah, I'm an FBI agent. And the fellow said, you're an FBI agent? He said, yeah, I'm an FBI agent. He said, can you bring them out to the back door? We get the front door locked. So, so I take them to the service entrance. And the fellow said, and you're all FBI agents. And Keith said, yeah, he said, and, and, uh, and the fellow said, how are you gonna pay for this? And he said, I have my checkbook right here. So the uh, point was, it was lack of communication. The fellow thought he was crazy instead of an FBI agent. <laughs> so in the end, he wouldn't deliver the pizzas, but uh, we did go pick them up ourselves. And it was a big tower full of pizza boxes. Uh, but that's a story of lack of communication. But what I like about the story, and I say this with all humility, most FBI agents can think outside the box. But I was in a room full of agents, and people were very upset with Keith because he wasn't getting them the dinner. He wasn't the getting pizza. pizzas. <laughs> and I think I was the only one who stood back far enough to see that this was humorous. So the next day, we all put the words together, and we reconstructed the conversation. And now it's become known as the FBI pizza call, and it's on the web in about half a million locations. I think even the, the not only the, the bureau director, but the CIA director has referred to it in speeches. Right. Jim Walsey, who's an old friend of mine, uh, he first gave it, I think, at an international organized crime um, conference, and he likes to start his speeches with some level of humor. So he read the pizza call out, which I had sent him, and he said, my friend out there says it's true, and it was. It wasn't us recording ourselves, but it was a reconstructed conversation for the next day. But of all the things I've done in the FBI, all the Soviets and Romanians, Czechs and Pauls, I've recruited all the factor debriefings. Uh, the one I'll be most remembered for is writing the FBI pizza <laughs> call. I'm sorry to say. And, and you did a TEDx talk in Miami in March of right. this year that uh, is very instructive also in why personnel security interviews, how they were created, and why they're important. Right, the genesis of the interview, there wasn't something intended to be done, but there was a, there was a hole in our security uh, in the Bureau that we didn't know about until a couple of interviews were conducted. An Afghan coming in to speak Pashto, who was actually sent by the Mujahideen to get his job with the FBI, and a fellow who had been an exchange student in Poland, unbeknownst to him when he came back, he had been married over there, he was married to a Polish intelligence officer. So those two cases and then the ones that followed were the reason for the creation of the official status of the personnel security interview as a program. Wayne, thank you very much. This has been a pleasure. My pleasure. Anytime I can help. <laughs>